Good morning and a greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I trust your experience with our Lord has been good this past week. The title of the message this morning is Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Lord. Now I want to clarify something if you're taking notes. The spelling and the punctuation of the word Lord. You know, often in the Bible the word Lord is used as a title. Jesus is Lord. We understand he is master. He is the commander. And we need to be the servants and the followers of our Lord. Jesus is Lord. That is a true statement um, this morning. Jesus is Lord. There's another way the word Lord is used in the Bible. And it inclu- it in- is inclusive of the first one, but it expands on that a little bit. And so if you're writing notes, the title of the message is Jesus is the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. Yes, this morning, the theme of the message is to declare the deity and the divinity of the Lord Jesus, and that we will understand once again his rightful place in the Godhead, because our belief about Jesus and who he is matters. And so I'm going to look at the definition this morning of the word Lord. Then I'm going to look a little bit at our belief in the Godhead. And then I'm going to look at the Old Testament and pull an example from the Old and look at the New that reveals the deity of Jesus. And then I have some things on why Jesus is Lord. And some, then we'll look at some false and misleading understandings of Jesus. And then l- lastly, we'll take a look at some responses that this truth about Jesus reveals. So let's look at the definition of the word Lord this morning. The Hebrew name for God, you may have seen it. It's represented in four letters. Why? H W H and in the original in the ancient Hebrew I understand there were no vowels so it's not possible for us to be certain exactly how the this name for God was originally pronounced uh, most people who study Hebrew would say it would have been pronounced Yahweh but that's not certain many centuries later the Hebrews did come up with vowels in their alphabet. But also then during this, this time, this would have been just prior to the time of Christ and then after as well, they began the practice of, of not speaking this name, this given name of God, choosing instead to use another name of God uh, to identify him that they felt was a lesser uh, name of God. And the one that they chose was Adonai, and so in their scriptures, they would, they would write the vowels for Adonai above the consonants for the given name of God because they were afraid to pronounce God's name because they did not want to take God's name in vain. So they would use his lesser name, they thought, uh, and they would, use the, they would have these vowels uh, above their scriptures to remind them to say this, this word when they, when they got to this name of God. Interestingly... In about the 13th century, there was a Spanish monk, and I don't remember his name, who was reading this way that the Hebrews had written the name of God, and he he took the the more recent edition of the vowels and added it to the consonants that they had uh, used since ancient times and came up with another word, that was Latin at the time, but then l- later was Anglicized. And uh, it's the word then in the 13th century is very much like the word that we use, that we hear today, Jehovah. And if you can just imagine some balls for Adonai added to the consonants for Yahweh, you could come up with something like that. But what's, I, I went down that bunny trail to, to tell you that if you're holding a version of the Bible this morning, it's important that you know this because some of the different English versions uh, would use this given name of God in, in different ways. The, new, the King James Bible 
we find the word Jehovah four times. I think it's once in Psalms, twice in um, Isaiah, and once in one of the, uh, the earlier books. I can't remember. Exodus, I believe. But in the New King James, you will not find the word Jehovah. The ESV, you will not find the word Jehovah. I believe in the, um, is it the American Standard Bible, you find the word Jehovah every time. That this original name for God is used. But a word that you will find in, in the New King James, a word that you will find most of the time in the King James, and if you have one of those Bibles this morning or an ESV, if you open up, up to the, the, the Old Testament and you can just flip through it, Many, many, many times you will find the word Lord, L-O-R-D, and it's, it's capitalized. That is what the gift that the English translators have given to us. This original name for God, Yahweh, is given to us in the capitalized Lord in the Bible. So if you want to do that, look through your Bibles. I was amazed how often that name for God appears in the Old Testament. It's there over 6,000 800 times. We'll get to that. Because the name, this name for God is tied to God's declaration that I am. And what that means is I am the self-existent one. I am the eternal. I am everywhere present. I am the all-knowing. I am the all-powerful. I bring, I am that which brings into existence everything that exists. It's a high name for God. It's a, it's a name that we will look at. But I want to also remind you that it's not the only name that God calls himself in the Bible. But it's a name that we're going to look at this morning. Turn to Deuteronomy 6. This was already referred to this morning in the devotions. I was intrigued at how God spoke through the songs and through the devotional, and through the Sunday school text. Let's read Deuteronomy 6. These well-known words, the words that the children of Israel heard over and over again. Verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, and you see it there, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The word Lord, just a few times of the many times that this term, this name that God gave himself and taught us to use is found in the Bible. Now our belief, and I believe what we believe as a, as a church here and as individuals aligns with what the Bible teaches and what has been the generally accepted belief of the church from the beginning of the church age is that there is truly only one God. The Lord our God is one. We believe that. We're not uh, we don't believe in multiple gods. We believe in one God. But we also, right along with that, believe that the one true God is one in essence, one in nature, and he's three in person, three in role, and three in function. Menno S Simons, in his writings, says this, these three names, activities, and powers, namely, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are one, incomprehensible, indescribable, almighty, holy, only, eternal, and sovereign God. And although they are three, yet in deity, will, power, and works they are one and can no more be separated from each other than can the sun, brightness, and warmth. For the one cannot exist without the other. He used an example of the sun, brightness, and warmth to describe this relationship that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have. Man has attempted to come up with examples and illustrations to help us understand the Trinity, 
1 plus 1 plus 1 equals not 3, but 1. Water, ice, and vapor are all H2O, but they're very different in nature. A triangle has three angles, three separate angles, and yet it's one shape. The human race. We heard recently here that there are not multiple races. There is one human race. And yet as we look around at the world and even as we look around this room, we recognize that we are all very, very, very different. We're all unique, and yet we're all one. Now those examples that were given, there was, I think, four of them that were given just now, they're man's attempt at explaining something that is, what does Menno Simon say, incomprehensible and indescribable. And that's okay. Our attempts to explain will be inadequate, yet we believe what the Bible teaches. So the Old Testament declares that Jesus is Lord, right along with his God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. And what I like about the Old Testament is that it speaks. The New Testament reveals. And we see this over and over again. John, in particular, records many of the convincing proofs that Jesus is God. And he corroborates what Isaiah prophesied. Now, these are men that lived more than 700 years apart in time. They never got to talk. They never met each other. And yet I'm amazed as we look at what Isaiah says in the Old Testament and what John reveals about Jesus in the New. It's amazing. I want to give you an example of that. And this is just one of many but please turn to Isaiah 6. And if you'd like to, you may please stand. We'll read the first 10 verses of Isaiah 6. And look for that word, Lord, with the capital letters, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord lift, sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull. And their eyes, their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. You may, all right, you may sit down, please. What did Isaiah experience here? Well, he saw the Lord sitting on a lofty throne. It must have been an amazing experience the Lord high but coming down to earth he saw worshipful obedient and reverent angels he 
he saw and heard shaking and he saw smoke. And he felt within himself his own undoneness, his insufficiency. And then he was cleansed with the live coal that came from off the altar. And then he heard this sad message about the people, his people, the ones whom he had been appointed to take the message to, that these people are not going to hear because they've chosen to not hear. Who did Isaiah see in this experience? Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, a lot of incredible things have already been happening before we uh, pick up the reading here in verse 35. Jesus was anointed. There was a plot to kill him. He entered Jerusalem triumphantly. He predicted his suffering and death. He called people to follow him. In verse 35, Jesus said to them, and I want, as I read, I want you to think about what we just read in Isaiah. Jesus said to them, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Isaiah 53, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, it sound, this what, what was happening now, it sounds a lot like the condition of the people back in Isaiah's time. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. That, there was a willful rebellion against God and his message. But I want you to notice verse 41. And these things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Whose glory? Who did Isaiah see back in Isaiah 6? Well, here John is clearly talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus. And he's, he's pointing back to these people aren't going to hear the message of Jesus Christ. This is what Isaiah experienced years ago, and this is happening. These people are not going to listen to the message of Christ. But Isaiah saw it, and he prophesied it at the time when he saw his glory, the glory of the Lord. I believe that this is pretty clear that the Lord that Isaiah saw was a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. Now, I will grant you that the vision that Isaiah saw may have included the Godhead together. It may have consisted of the, of the Godhead, but it certainly was the Lord, because John said he saw him in his glory back in Isaiah 6. The Lord. He was not a man. He was God in the flesh. There are so many other connections like that. You be Bereans and find them. There's, there's a connection from Psalm 110 to Matthew 22. There's a connection from Joel 2 to Acts 2 and Romans 10. There's a connection from the Psalms to the Hebrews. Over and over again, the name Lord, because it's, that word is only used in the Old Testament or in prophecies or in quotes in the New Testament that refer to the Old such as in our Sunday school lesson this morning, we had that quote, the Lord is my helper, pointing back to, I believe it's Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I be afraid? 
many, many times. The name, the high and holy name for God that is used in the Old Testament is placed upon, without a shadow of a doubt, Jesus Christ in the new. And when Jesus in, in John 8 referred to himself as the I am, it so infuriated the Jews that they took up stones to kill him. They knew what he was claiming. He was claiming deity. So why is Jesus Lord? Why is he the Lord? Now, there is no New Testament record of, of, of Jesus that I can find saying, I am God, in those three words. But there are, I think, well, there's over a hundred passages in the New Testament that reveal to us that he is God, indeed. A very, very strong case. Let me give you a few of those. He is creator. You young people were studying Colossians 1. You came to verse 16 the other evening. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Jesus was at the creation. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is consistent. We read that in our Sunday school this morning. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I like that it says forever instead of tomorrow. He is not, it doesn't say he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. But it, that word forever is a reminder to us of his eternal existence. Jesus healed people while he lived on the earth and performed other miracles. The question has been asked, was Jesus acting as a prophet sent from God and he would call on God to do the healing or did he perform miracles of his own volition and power as a divine being? Well, what does the Bible say? There was a leper that came to Jesus, a leper that needed healing, and he, said, he came and worshipped him in Matthew 8, verses 2 and 3. He said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. What did Jesus say? I need to confer with God and see what God says. Jesus said, I am willing, is what he said. I am willing, be thou cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. Jesus performed miracles of his own volition and power. And the story that I just referred to also illustrates another point about the deity of Christ. Is that This is important that he accepted the worship of people. This is just one example. This leper came and worshipped him. There are numerous other re uh, recorded examples of Jesus accepting worship. The Old Testament is clear that only God is worthy of worship. And you remember that story in the Revelations. I believe it occurs two times, but in Revelation 22, John is just amazed at what he sees, and he, and he bows down and begins to worship the angel that's showing him these things. And the angel says, no, no, don't do that. Worship God. The angel was not willing and able. He knew it was wrong to accept worship of man. Jesus accepted worship numerous times. Now, pompous, conceited men will demand worship. The devil craves worship. The desire to be worshipped is either very anti-God or it's true God. And I believe that Jesus, when he accepted worship, revealed to us that he is God. Jesus forgives sins. He said, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. And that was blasphemy to the ears of the scribes who heard him say that. Because they understood, they knew that only God is able to forgive sins. But Jesus validated that forgiveness, which is hard to see, by doing something that was easy for them to see. That person that received forgiveness was also paralyzed, and Jesus healed him of his paralysis. The demons identify Jesus as divine. There's a story of a man in Mark 1, 22 and 23, who had an unclean spirit, and he cried out, but it wasn't him. It was the demon within saying, let us alone. What have we to do 
with you, Jesus of Nazareth. Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. See, even the demons recognized who he was and he, that he is divine. And they didn't like it. And Jesus exercised his power over that demon and cast him out from the man. Jesus invites prayers and he answers prayers. Now, I believe it's very important that we pray like we often do at the end of our service. Our Father, we address our prayers to God the Father. But it's also appropriate that we pray to Jesus. Because we know from the scriptures that people prayed to him. And he invited their prayers. In John 14, 14, he says, If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's what he said to his disciples. This is what he says to us. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. And he's it's talking there in 1 John 5, verse 14, about Jesus. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. So it's appropriate to pray because he invites our prayers and he answers our prayers. Jesus conquered death. On at least three occasions, Jesus brought back from the dead, brought back to life someone who had died. And then he himself arose from the dead. He says in Revelation 1.18, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. He conquered death. Man is not able to do that. He gives eternal life. I have given them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 28. And this is a present tense action. I believe Jesus is still exercising his divinity as he continually offers and gives eternal life to his followers. I'd like to talk just a little bit about some false and mistaken understandings of Jesus and his lordship. Talk about atheists just for a little bit. An atheist denies the existence of God, but an atheist would find it hard to deny the historical reality of Jesus because there are so many proofs that Jesus did live and did walk on the earth. So he may say something like this, Jesus was a good moral teacher, but an atheist would, of course, deny that Jesus is God. He would deny that Jesus rose from the dead. He would deny Jesus in that way. But to be a good moral teacher and to make the claims of truth that Jesus did and not be God would be preposterous. And it would be a little bit like uh, C.S. Lewis says in his book, Mere Christianity, it would, it would put man on the equivalent of being a lunatic, a poached egg, or else he would be the equivalent to being the devil. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman and something worse. Jesus made claims, and he was fully competent and faithful to follow through on those claims. And an atheist needs to come to a place of recognition of that. He can't be a good moral teacher only because of all the claims of truth that he made. He's God. There's a group of people called the Christadelphians. And among other unbiblical things, this group of people reject the deity of Jesus. They have some ties to first century Gnosticism, although they're a fairly recent group. But they say something interesting. They say that Jesus did not exist before his earthly birth, that he was given a God spirit as a man while on the earth, uh, that God spirit was, was put into a man. And because they don't believe that it's possible for God to die, they would reject his divinity because Jesus died. But they worship Jesus, and they, they think it's important to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior, um, they teach that salvation comes through believing 
in him. I ask you the question this morning, do you want to believe in a Lord and Savior who is a human being only? Would you take salvation from him? That's a wrong belief. We're more familiar with the JWs, and I don't like to use their name because they're actually false witnesses. They're not true witnesses. But they would deny that Jesus is God, that he is Jehovah. They would believe that Jesus was created just prior to the creation of all things, that Jesus was a God with a small g, and that God, the God overall, tasked Jesus with the work of creating this world. Hence, in their own version, which is a wrong version of the Bible, they have added that verse that you studied, young people, Colossians 1.16. They have added this word, by him all other things were created, to signify that uh, he is also a created being. They've also added a word in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. And I don't know much about Greek, but Greek scholars would say it would be virtually impossible to translate that into English. The intent of what was originally given in Greek it just wouldn't be right. It's an added word. Those are added things. It's not like they have some kind of an ancient text that they've found that is purer. No, it's a corruption of the word of God. The Mormon church, the Latter-day Saints as they're called, they would also deny the eternal deity of Christ. They say that Jesus was created by God and that he has a brother by the name of Satan. In the process of time, Jesus progressed to become equal to God, and so God gave him the earth. But Satan thwarted the plan that Jesus had for the earth, so they say. So Jesus needed to go and die for his creation in order to redeem them, so that they could, so that those people too could progress to become equal with God someday. Because all of us, they say, are on a progression to become gods. We have the possibility to become a god. And that there are millions of planets out there yet to be inhabited by those of us humans who later will become gods. And that's a false idea. It's also the false idea that the emperor Constantine imposed the doctrine of the deity and the uh, trinity during the time of the Council of, of Nicaea. And that would be an interesting discussion, but in my studies, the long and short of it is that Constantine really didn't care as much about doctrinal purity as he cared about peace in his, his kingdom. And by far, the, far, the vast majority of the 230 people who were at the Council of Nicaea affirmed and reaffirmed what the church had always practiced from the beginning, that Jesus Christ, the very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered. The third day he rose again, ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. What are some practical responses that the truth about Jesus being Lord requires from us? Well, when we think about it, my friends, that when the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame, that should shape within me an attitude of humility and thankfulness and love, and joy, and eternal gratefulness, and a desire to be willingly obedient, those would all be appropriate responses. When we think of the distance that Jesus came to redeem you and to redeem me, realizing 
this, that another practical response is realizing that my view of Jesus is shaped by what I consume about him. Is my view of, of the living word, Jesus Christ, being shaped and formed by the written word? And I was recently convicted. I have committed in the past to reading the Sermon on the Mount frequently, and it's time to read it again. I want him to shape me. There is a series of shows that has been broadcast on TV and other streaming uh, platforms. It's called The Chosen. I want to talk about The Chosen just a little bit. Because it's taken, it seems to have taken the Christian world by storm. And maybe, maybe even some of the Mennonite Christian world. It's meant to be a depiction, a historic and human depiction of Christ, Jesus, and his disciples as they lived life in Palestine. And I have an acquaintance who traveled to Texas uh, to be an extra at the feeding of the 5,000, the filming of that in, for the chosen. And he seemed to have thoroughly enjoyed that experience. But I've never watched anything of the chosen, so you might say I'm not qualified to give commentary on that. But I've read a lot, and I've made some conclusions. Whenever we attempt to recreate what God's inspired word says, it can very quickly become problematic. We can soon become guilty of adding to or subtracting from God's word and what God intended. And I, I've not seen, but I have read that there are scenes in these productions that are inconsistent with what God would have intended for us to know about his son, Jesus Christ. Instead, it is a depiction of what the producers want to represent about Jesus Christ. And in this particular series, The Chosen, there is a, it's produced, the executive producer is a professing evangelical Christian, uh, but he's working with other producers, he's working with actors, he's working with advisors, some of whom are Catholic, Jewish, and Mormon. And one filming of The Chosen took place in Utah at a re recreated replica of part of the city of Jerusalem that was owned by the Mormon church. The producer, while or shortly after he was working with his newfound Mormon friends, said this about the whole project and the idea of him working with them. I don't mind being called a blasphemer. I don't like it when my friends are called that. I made it very clear that if I go down, I'm going down, protecting my friends and my brothers and sisters. And so I don't deny that we have a lot of theological differences, but we love the same Jesus. And he was talking about the Mormons when he was talking about that. Um, we know we've heard a little bit about their view of Jesus Christ. Is it possible for this word to become more alive when man enhances it and colors it with his own ideas? Maybe it would be good for us to, di to distribute the chosen to all the people who haven't seen and read and know about the gospel message. No, that would be wrong. John says at the end of his book, Jesus did many, many things that if the entire, or if everything would be written, the entire world couldn't hold the volume of books. However, what was written is important. And what was written and given to us is sufficient. And lastly, one other response. Sooner than we can imagine, sooner than we might believe, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And one of the proofs that Jesus is Lord is that he will be our judge. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That should put within us a soberness, a carefulness, and a burning love to do what Paul, burning desire to do what Paul said just prior to that. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing 
to him. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.